traffic control. This is a linear Gaussian optimization problem. We're going to take this picture over here on the left, which shows a city traffic grid. And each of the avenues in the city traffic grid can handle up to 1,500 vehicles. And each of the streets can handle up to 1,000 vehicles per hour. So we want to come up with a set of formulas for each intersection. And then we want to stick it into a matrix, solve this, and find out what we need to do to keep traffic flowing without causing any gridlock. So the first step is to set up a set of equations. Set up some linear equations, a series of linear equations. Set up our linear equations. Alright, to do this we're going to talk about each intersection one at a time. Let's talk about this first intersection. X1 and X6 are involved in this intersection. And if we add those together, what we're talking about in this intersection is 9 plus 800. That's what's going into it. And so this leaves us with 1700. This is a formula that describes this first intersection. Moving on to the next intersection, what happens? Well, X1's going into it. X7's going into it. But X2's going away from it. And the only number that I have for this intersection is 700. So we set this equal to 700. And that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to go at each intersection and talk about what numbers of cars are flowing in or out of it, and then we're going to talk about what numbers attach to it. Getting to this intersection, X2 is going into it, X3 is going away from it. And for this intersection, I've got 600 going in, 900 going out, that's a 300 difference between them. All right, looking at the last couple of intersections, we've got, last three I guess, into this intersection. Probably should have come up with some clever names for this. I've got X3 going into this intersection. I've got X4 going out of this intersection. And the difference between 1,000 and 600 leaves me with 400. Into the next to last intersection here, what have we got? I have X4 going in. Oops. I've got X4 going in. I've got X5 going out. I've got X7 going out. And 700 is the number that I see attached to this intersection. If it feels like I'm playing a little free and loose with whether um, things are going in or out of intersections and whether I put positives or negatives in front of the X's, you can see, if you play around with it long enough, that all I'm really trying to do is make sure that all of these numbers over here are positive. That's what's leading to sometimes it looks like I subtract something going out, sometimes I add something going in, that sort of difference. Finally, for my very last intersection that I need to talk about here, X5 and X6 are in play. And 11 plus 700 is going to leave me with 1800. This is the set of the linear equations that I'm looking at. And so this is my initial linear equation that I'm trying to solve. Unlike my last video where I had a very small set of linear equations and it almost seemed pointless to do Gauss-Jordan, this is big enough that it's clearly going to be a big advantage to be able to have a matrix to solve this up. And that leads us to part B of this problem. We want to set up a Gauss-Jordan system of equations and then we want to solve it. So on my top row I have 1 and 1. I've got 1 in column 1. We're going to have 7 columns all together because I have the numbers 1 through x7 
each of these variables gets its own column and then the augmented part here on the very top row I'm going to slap that 1700 in. For my second row what have I got going? Well, I have 1, I've got negative 1 for x2, then a whole bunch of zeros till I get to x7. And I've got 700. I'm going to keep on filling in this matrix, give myself enough room here. Got those first two rows. Next row, I've got x2, and I've got x3, negative 1 for those two. Everybody else is zeros and that's going to be 300. I'm going to have 400, 700, and lastly 1800. What am I going to have here for the 400 row? I'm going to have a negative in my x3 column, I'm going to have a positive one in my x4 column, and all other entries will be zero. My 700 row x4 is negative 1, x5 is 1, x7 is 1, the other entries are 0. And lastly I have x5 and x6 is 1, all other entries are 0. This is my list here. We are in this section, this is section in our book uh, 2.3, at least in this version of TAN, and we're going to do Gauss-Jordan on this. I've already talked about Gauss-Jordan in another video. For time constraints, what I want to do is I want to take this, and we're going to do row operations on this, but I'm just going to skip to the end. Give us the final answer here. So you do a whole bunch of row operations. Something happens here. It's an important thing that happens here, but we're just going to go through and skip and ignore it. And here's the matrix that I get at the very end of the day. I've already done this on scratch paper here off my computer. I get 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1700. I get 0, 1, 0, 0. All right, we're back. I just filled out this and didn't make you waste time seeing it. So here is my final answer as a matrix, my final matrix at least. And these are the numbers I get. This is after I've done the Gauss-Jordan process and row reduced this to its final form. And now we want to talk about what those answers mean. This bottom row being all zeros, that tells me that when I'm looking at my set of answers, the part that corresponds to x7, it's going to be anything I want. All zeros tells me something that's always true. I can let x7 be any number. Rather than call it x7, we usually give it a placeholder name. I'm going to give it the placeholder name t. Remember, when you're talking about solutions of linear equations, your final answer is going to be a coordinate system that gives you the answer for x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6, and then x7. So I'm looking for a series of numbers and some letters that will let me do a seven-part answer. And this will be the solution that lets me get some traffic patterns to happen. This T right here means right here where X7 is happening. I can pick all sorts of numbers on there as long as for X7, it doesn't overflow the capacity of a thousand vehicles per hour on that street. That's the most that the street can have. So as long as X7 is less than a thousand, as long as I pick a number that's less than a thousand for this T here, we're going to be fine. And I'm going to make all these other numbers over here depend on T. And you move up the matrix from bottom up. And so when I look at this second line of the matrix, I see that I have both x5 and x6 here. And x5 plus x6 equals 1800. I don't have a single row where I just have the solution for x6. Because of that, x6 is also going to be 
sort of a variable in play. It can be just about anything we want. Again, subject to the constraint that x6 is living on a street, and that means x6 better be less than 1,000, otherwise this street's going to get congested. You don't want that. I didn't get x6 was a variable because it had this whole row here with zeros. I got that x6 was going to be sort of free because this second row here from the bottom has both x5s and x6s, and both of them together have to equal 1,800. I make this guy be a variable too. I don't want to call him T, so I'll call him S. So I go down here. I've got my X5. I'm calling X6 S now. This tells me something, though, about X5. It's going to be 1800 minus S. I can solve this like just any algebra equation I might like to do. So X5 is going to be 1800 minus S. Next, we can go up and look at X4. Here's where x4 is. This is going to be the row that tells me about this. Whenever I see um, this sixth place, I call that s. Whenever I see this x seventh place, I call that t. And this gets me an equation. Let's look at what that equation says. It says, look, x4 plus x6, which we're calling s, plus a negative 1 times t. Maybe I call that minus t for simplicity's sake equals 1100. If I solve this for x4, well I have 1100 plus t minus s. So this is the number that I put in here for x4. It's 1100 minus s plus t. Same deal for x3. This is the row where x3 comes into play. X3 is also depending on S and T, as well as this number 700. Solving the same process, let me give myself some more space to write it out here. For X3, I'm going to get 700 minus S plus T. For X2, I'm going to get 1000 minus S plus T. And lastly, for x1, I'm going to get 1700 minus s. So my final answer for in terms of what's reasonable to expect is this. This is the relationship of traffic that can happen. You don't expect a single traffic pattern to happen on any day in the city. And this solution tells me it doesn't have to be a single traffic pattern. S and T can do different things depending on different days. They just can't go over this thousand vehicle requirement because they're coming on these streets. This gives me infinite solutions. These infinite solutions, meaning that I can play around with S and T as much as I like, and once I've picked S and T, then that's going to force every one of these other traffic patterns to do certain things because we have to keep the flow of traffic moving. You can get all sorts of different traffic patterns you like and again you can pick any numbers you like for S&T as long as they are smaller than a thousand.